Kurt Cobain once famously called Pearl Jam pioneering a corporate alternative and blank rock fusion, while Motley Crue labeled them as one of the most boring bands in history. Yet Pearl Jam has not only survived these high-profile feuds, but thrived, becoming one of rock's most enduring acts. From their early days in Seattle's grunge scene to their battles with music industry giants, Pearl Jam's story is filled with fascinating conflicts that helped shape their legacy. Their rivalries with fellow musicians weren't just tabloid fodder. Maybe they were in certain cases, but they also represented a deeper ideological battle about authenticity, commercialism, and the soul of rock music itself. In today's video, let's talk about Pearl Jam's rivalries over their three-decade run. Dubbed by Kerrang! Magazine as the lamest beef in music history, Sugar Ray briefly feuded with Pearl Jam. The feud dated back to 1997 when Pearl Jam guitar Stone Gossard gave an interview and slammed so-called corporate rock. Apparently Sugar Ray frontman Mark McGrath took offense. McGrath has been a longtime Pearl Jam fan, telling the Huffington Post, Our whole band was in New York City riding in a taxi cab. Sugar Ray's single Mean Machine suddenly came on the radio. I think it was K-Rock. We made a cabbie pull over and we just started dancing on the streets. It was one of the greatest moments of my entire life. They said, that was Van Halen, this is Sugar Ray, coming up shortly Pearl Jam. We thought we died and went to heaven. McGrath took a swipe at Pearl Jam in an interview with an online magazine called All Star, stating, I'd love to say corporate rock sucks, but it doesn't suck for us. You can buck the system like Pearl Jam and you'll get results like Pearl Jam. But then don't sit around and go, why didn't Pearl Jam's no code sell better? Well, you haven't made a video in years and you're so stuck in your cocoon, you don't know what's going on. McGrath was taking a swipe at Pearl Jam's hardline stance against making music videos following their debut album 10's success in addition to their feud with Ticketmaster that saw them play out-of-the-way venues and cancel shows. In 2001, the New York Post penned a piece about how bands were now turning to private gigs to make extra money, specifically corporate gigs. The article highlighted the differences between groups like Sugar Ray and Pearl Jam, stating, companies are hiring people like Sugar Ray and the Wallflowers to say, hey, look, we're hip, we're young, and we understand the Y generation. Another corporate booker, speaking of Pearl Jam, Fish, and Bruce Springsteen said, none of them can be bought at any price. You can call their people, but that's as far as you'll get. The two bands did, however, appear in 2007 on the same soundtrack for the animated film Surf's Up. This feud kicked off when Vetter gave an interview to a New York publication talking about working rock shows before forming Pearl Jam. And he recalled, I'd end up at shows that I wouldn't have chosen to go to, bands that monopolized the late 80s MTV. The metal bands, I'm, I'm trying to be nice. I despise Girls, Girls, Girls and Molly Crew. F you, I hated it. I hated how it made the fellows look. I hated how it made the women look. In the same interview, Vetter gave a shout out to groups like Guns N' Roses with bringing some teeth to the LA scene. Well, apparently Vetter's comments made it back to Molly Crew bassist Nikki Six, who took to Twitter to write, made me laugh today reading how much the singer and Pearl Jam hated Molly Crew. Now considering they're one of the most boring bands in history, it's kind of a compliment, isn't it? It's funny because Nikki Six almost predicted the rise of alternative music in the early 90s. We're at that point right now when you get this kind of dinosaur music mentality going on where everybody looks the same, everybody sounds the same. We're getting into that again, which is everything that, that punk rebelled against in the 70s. I think it's time for a revolution, a musical revolution. So, so someone's got to do something original. Six appeared on a Brazilian podcast in early 2022 talking about Vetter stating, listen, let's face it, the guy flies around in private jets, he lives in a mansion, in a gated community, he sells out stadiums, and then he dresses at the thrift store and tries to pretend to be the same guy in the 90s. Six went on to add that him and his bandmates embraced change and they were big fans of Nirvana. Then Pearl Jam shared on social media a video of their fans excited at a recent show in February of 2022 with the caption, we love our bored fans. Pearl Jam guitar Stone Gossard came out and defended Molly Crew, telling the Revolver fan podcast, Jeff and Mike and I loved hard rock. I bought the first Molly Crew album on Leather Records. I thought it was, at the time, it was punk-like. It had that same energy, it's like Motorhead. Despite Nicky Six saying he was a fan of grunge and embracing it, Vince Neil wasn't, as he told an interviewer here. I didn't like it. I still don't like it. I never understood about singing about how f your life is when everybody knows their lives are f up. The next generation was more about, you know, teen angst and, you know, I hate my parents rather than let's go out and have some fun and f***ing chicks. In the mid-90s, Guns N' Roses attempted to try and write what would be their follow-up to 1993's The Spaghetti Incident. 
But tensions within the group resulted in the band imploding. One of the sticking points was musical direction. Ex-guitarist Gilby Clark was fired by frontman Axl Rose, and he told Spin Magazine in 1999, My last conversation with Axl was when he called me and was trying to explain what he wanted to do, and basically it was, I want to change the sound of the band. You know, I want to go more in the current direction. He was really into bands like Jane's Addiction, Pearl Jam, and Nine Inch Nails, and I just kind of laughed and said, You know, look, I want to play guitar in a loud version of the Rolling Stones, you know. Guitarist Slash, meanwhile, told Hard Rock Magazine what this time was like in the band, talking about how Axel didn't like the material he had come up with at the time. That resulting material became Slash's first Snake Pit album, It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere. Slash added, Axel didn't really care because he only wanted to play industrial and Pearl Jam sounding crap. Smashing Pumpkins leader Billy Corgan has never been one to hide his feelings on the music industry or other artists. He was on Howard Stern's show when he was promoting Monuments to an Elegy in 2014. Stern brought up Pearl Jam and Nirvana. Here's what he had to say about both groups. I love competition. I grew up playing sports. That's one thing that makes me crazy about alternative music. You're supposed to be just kind of nice and namby-pamby. I, I think I love competition. I think it's fantastic. So th let's speak competitively for a second. Sure. I would say out of the whole era of when you, when you came uh, onto the scene, that you and that, let's say the band Nirvana mm -hmm. were probably the two most influential and important bands to come out of that whole scene. No That's Pearl Jam? No. 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 Okay. Not, not even close. <laughs> oh, would you say they were derivative? Is that why? Absolutely. Wow. And I think, and I think, um, you know, I think the work speaks for itself. I you, think if you listen to the band's work, then you, you know, I know they have a tremendous fan base, and uh, they should. Uh, right. Great band, but. You're saying that maybe the music won't stand the test of time? I don't know. That's a hard thing to say. That's a hard thing to say. But competitively, you're willing to say, look, his music is second tier to yours. I don't think they have the songs. Right. I think you stack my songs up, Cobain's songs up, and that band's songs is don't have the songs. They're a great band, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Look, they're still an arena act, right, okay? Right, That's that They've gotten it done for a long time. I have to bow to that. What, what, how have they gotten it done for such a long time if they don't have the songs? That's a mystery to me because I, I, don't, I don't get it. Yeah. If Eddie Vedder called you up today and said, let's do an album together, or mm -hmm. let's write together, let's do that, would you say no? I, I don't think that that would I'd be... I'd have to understand his motivation. I, I mean, we, we were friends at one point, so, you know, it's not that there's no, it's not there's no relationship train track there. Are you not friends now? No, I haven't been in a social frame with the guy for, pff, I can't even remember, it's so long. Was there a falling it's Jay out? It's Leno. I, <laughs> yeah, right. Was it a falling out? Like it happened so long No, ago. no, no. I just, I think, um, I think um, a lot of people are transformed by fame. Are you general? Oh, you, oh, in other words, he became... Well, I knew one person, and then there was another person. Now, it is that, weird. That I'm another person, so I, you know, I'm saying that, and maybe he felt the same way about me. While Pearl Jam and Nirvana sonically sounded different, the media loved to lump them together under the umbrella term grunge. Despite sounding different, they still appeal to the same generation of people. As the LA Times put it, a generation of young people aged 15 to 25 who feel they have been shortchanged by the American dream. Pearl Jam guitarist Mike McCready told author Mark Yarm in Everybody Loves Our Town, I remember after the New Year's Eve 1991 show, somebody running onto the bus and saying Nirvana has just hit number one. I remember thinking, wow, it's on now. It changed everything. We had something to prove that our band was as good as I thought it was. In the same book, Pearl Jam's manager Kelly Curtis revealed how the group's label Epic Records struggled to market the band initially. They didn't know whether the group was metal or alternative, but he credited Nirvana for opening the door to radio. Vetter admitted in the same book that while he thought Pearl Jam's debut 10 was good, he thought Nirvana's first record was better. Although it's not clear whether he's referring to Nirvana's first actual album, Bleach, or their major label debut, Nevermind. The website knkx.org interviewed Charles R. Cross, a local Seattle writer and author of the Kurt Cobain biography, Heavier Than Heaven, who claimed the feud between Pearl Jam and Nirvana stemmed from several interviews that Kurt Cobain did. Cobain was apparently tired at the time of discussing his drug addiction and wanted to talk about anything else and it wasn't out of the ordinary for him to talk about other bands in good and bad ways. One of those bands was Pearl Jam. Given that Nirvana and Pearl Jam were some of the biggest bands at the time, Cobain's comments carried quite a bit of weight. Perhaps the most famous line Cobain stated about Pearl Jam was that the band was, and I quote, pioneering a corporate alternative and cock rock fusion. In the book Everybody Loves Our Town, Pearl Jam bassist Jeff Ahmed weighed in saying, Kurt was talking shit about us and we talked a little shit. Back. In retrospect, I think it was when we got interviewed, the second or third question was about Nirvana, and I'm sure they were getting the same questions about us. 
Ament pointed the finger at writer Michael Azarad for igniting the feud. He was the author behind the 1993 book Come As You Are. Here's what Cobain told MTV about Pearl Jam. And friends, what's up with we you never, and Eddie? We never had a fight, ever. I just have always hated their band. <laughs> but it's not like you're friends or anything. No, well, I mean, I, I can consider him a person that I really like. I mean, we've had a few conversations on the phone. I, I really like him. I think he's a nice, really... Cobain also gave an interview to Rolling Stone in 1994, where the exchange went as follows. The interviewer asked him, it's never been entirely clear what this feud with Vetter was about, to which he responded, there never was one. I slagged them off because I didn't like their band. I hadn't met Eddie at the time. It was my fault. I should have been slagging off the record company instead of them. They were marketed, not probably against their will, but without them realizing they were being pushed into the grunge bandwagon. The interviewer responded, don't you feel empathy for them? They've been under the same intense follow-up album pressure as you have, to which Cobain responded, yeah, I do, except I'm pretty sure they didn't go out of their way to challenge their audience as much as we did with this record. They're a safe rock band. They're a pleasant rock band that everyone likes. I'm going to stroke my ego by saying that we're better than a lot of bands out there. What I've read is that you need a couple of catchy songs on an album. The rest can be BS, bad company ripoffs, and it doesn't matter. It would be ironic that many of Nirvana's peers saw Pearl Jam as staying more tried and true to their punk rock ethos. Because in reality, some of the members of Pearl Jam, including bassist Jeff Ament and guitar Stone Gossard, played in two prior bands, including Green River and Mother Love Bone, who were hugely influential in the music scene in Seattle. Green River were on the scene years before Nirvana showed up, and Green River and Mudhoney vocalist Mark Arm in the same book recalled touring with Nirvana and how much of a painful experience it was, stating, Pearl Jam probably did as much for unknown bands as Nirvana ever did. We did the first few weeks of the In Utero tour in the States, and by this time Nirvana was a big machine, and the tour was f***ing painful. The whole vibe that was going on. They'd surrounded themselves with so many gross management people. Just sick, gross people that I never would want to associate myself with in any kind of relationship. And this was from a band that came up through Sub Pop, through punk rock roots. In the same interview though, Arm praised Pearl Jam for calling the shots in their career, while still being signed to a major label, including not doing music videos after 10 and picking a fight with Ticketmaster. Jeff Ament was upset with Kurt's comments, adding, we were putting out records on Homestead Records while Kurt was going to Sammy Hagar concerts. At that point, I was like, you wanna talk punk rock credibility? I can back it up. I was there when it was going down. Ament did add that he tried to approach Kurt about having an open conversation about the whole matter, but the frontman wasn't very receptive. He did say that Nirvana bassist Chris Novoselic was much cooler, thinking the whole feud was ridiculous. It wasn't just a ment who Cobain rubbed the wrong way, as former Pearl Jam drummer Dave Abrazisi added, when Nirvana were going on stage at the Cow Palace, I said have a good night to Kurt, and he growled at me. The drummer recalled grabbing Cobain and almost getting into a fistfight with him, but Pearl Jam's tour manager broke it up. Nirvana's former manager Danny Goldberg discussed the rivalry in his book Serving the Servants, revealing that Cobain was competitive with other bands. By 1993, Pearl Jam was commercially bigger than Nirvana. Their second record, Versus, outsold in utero and set first week sales records, with Goldberg revealing to New York radio station Q104.3, there's no question Vetter was somebody that he personally did like, but he felt competitive with Pearl Jam, and he wanted Nirvana to be number one, no question about it. It was a bigger record and it was Pearl Jam's moment. Kurt was not crazy about that. He called me once and said, geez, I've seen three Pearl Jam videos on MTV and our video only once. Is someone mad at us there? Is there something we should do? I said, Kurt, these things go in cycles. It's fine, they like you at MTV. Even some of the staff at MTV came to Pearl Jam's defense in the rivalry. MTV VJ Steve Isaacs penned a letter to Rolling Stone following Nirvana's first cover story calling Kurt's attitude pretentious. Kurt apparently read the letter and was so upset about it that when MTV filmed Nirvana's tour in Spain, the band sent the television network a fax that read, anybody but Steve can interview us. And fast forward to April of 1994 and the rock world was shocked to learn the news of Kurt Cobain's death. Vetter recalled hearing the news of Cobain's death telling Mark Yarm that he was in Washington DC. And when he heard the news, he destroyed everything in sight in his hotel room. It just happened to be a coincidence that at the same time, Pearl Jam members minus Dave Abrazisi were there to meet with President Clinton. At that point in time, the Clinton administration was looking at closing some military bases around the country, and Pearl Jam thought they could play some benefit shows to raise some money for the impacted communities. 
Pearl Jam's manager recalled to Mark Yarm. We got summoned to the Oval Office and Clinton asked Eddie if he should address the nation. Eddie said, I don't think you should address the nation. Vetter was worried that there would be possible copycat effect of bringing attention to Cobain's death. Almost a week later after Cobain's death, Pearl Jam appeared on Saturday Night Live as the musical guest and Vetter paid tribute to Cobain. In the Pearl Jam documentary 20, which came out in 2011, a clip emerged of Cobain and Vetter slow dancing to Eric Clapton during the 1992 MTV Video Music Awards. Then just a few years ago, Eddie Vetter appeared on Howard Stern's Sirius XM show and Stern brought up Pearl Jam's rivalry with Nirvana. Did you take it personally at the time when, when, when the band started out and like a guy like Kurt Cobain would publicly dismiss your band and say you guys were too commercial or too pop or whatever the said. You guys ended up being friends and everything and, and he ended up appreciating you, of course. Did that shit get to you at the time? Were you like, why has everybody got to be so goddamn competitive? I probably could have agreed with some of the things he said. And there was also a history of, you know, some of the local bands and one of my favorite Seattle bands was Mud Honey, and, and there was a little bit of a faction of this, this one side of Seattle music here, and, and ours didn't fit as well into that, which was fine. Um, right. But also, Mud Honey, I was so grateful to have those guys as friends, and so I think the only thing that bothered me about that was because it was, it was more public and people reacting to it. You know, I, it wasn't like between us or that stuff wasn't really going back and forth with us. And I think there was a, a certain writer who kind of pulled a quote of Jeff Amons out and then pulled a quote, a quote of Kurtz out and then kind of, you know, that, that made for interesting press. Uh, press. But, you know, really, I always felt like it was kind of us against the world, like our town against the world, not, not our band against another band. That does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again in Rock and Ultra Story Sticker.